Okay, um, welcome everybody to the University of Reading. My name is Nicola Wilson, I'm one of the directors of the Centre for Book Cultures and Publishing, and we're really delighted that you could all be here tonight, and also to the online audience, welcome and hello, thank you for being with us. Um, so this is the first event that the Centre for Book Cultures and Publishing has run with creative writing at Reading, and we're so excited that we can um, bring Kit to, to talk to you all today. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to Shelley uh, Harris, who has organised the event and, and brought Kit in and worked with to get um, to invite Wallingford Books along as well, so you'll be able to purchase um, some books later on if, if you'd like. Um, Shelley and Kit are both, um, uh, I put down here powerhouses, but both hugely important um, contemporary novelists. Um, Shelley is the author of two novels, Jubilee and Vigilante. Um, Jubilee was the radio for a book at bedtime when it came out and also very excitingly um, a Richard and Judy book club choice. Shelley is one of our, le uh, our lecturer in creative writing here and is kind of heading up the creative writing department at Reading which is expanding all the time. Um, Kids, as you will all know, is the author of several books including My Name is Leon um, and Supporting Cast and I um, teach working class writing. Uh, we have a module here in uh, the third year called Class Matters and it's fantastic to be able to include common people on that and um, we're all yeah super grateful for all the work you've done in Champion and different types of writers to be published. Um, so yeah I'll pass over to Shelley, thank you very much and thank you all for being here. Here's to Shelley. Well thank you, um, thank you audience here, Thank you, people online, and um, most of all, thank you, Kit, for coming. Uh, Great for to be here. I thank think you. it's going to be fab. It is going to be fab. Fab and lovely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, as um, Nicola said quite rightly, um, Kit has an extraordinary range as a writer. She is a writer of short stories, both um, in single publications and a lovely, lovely collection supporting cast. Um, she uh, has written novels that we'll go on to talk about. She has written uh, a YA book, which is a twist on Moby Dick involving a teenager in a BW camper van. Um, and she, uh, of course, as Nicola mentioned, um, she edited the iconic working class anthology or anthology of working class writing, Common People. But we're gonna start with this. So a friend of mine says, we call this the stroke and hold. Do you do stroke and hold? Stroke and hold. Are you ready? Stroke and hold. <laughs> stroke <laughs> and hold. Um, this is without warning and only sometimes, a, mem a stunning memoir. I'm not being polite. <laughs> I commend this book to you and I can commend this book to you because it's just come out in paperback and there are lots of copies over there signed by Kit, which you can kind of get your hands on later. Um, I'd like, I, I want to kind of lead with talking about this. Here's, I'm going to just talk a little bit about it, but honestly, you're not going to hear much of me because I'm yeah, going to get you to yeah. read a bit from it. Okay. And yeah. we're going to talk about it. Um, the thing that I think, there's a couple of things that are so interesting about this memoir. One is if you love Kit's fiction, you'll already be familiar with the sort of nuanced compassion with which she treats all of her characters. In Kit's fiction, you, you don't, it's very, very unusual to get somebody who is a kind of um, easily, kind of easily niched, even the, in, even the people who do the things we hate most in Kit's fiction, we, we come to understand something quite profound about them. And what's really fascinating to me is she's turned this compassionate eye on her own family and her own childhood. So if you, if you know her fiction, this is going to feel kind of familiar in a way. I also think there's a real clear sightedness about it because it takes place in 1970s and kind of moves into 1980s yeah. Birmingham. And it's so, it's so clear sighted about the political and social context in which you lived your quite extraordinary childhood. Yeah. Um, would you like to read us a bit? I will, but before I read, thank you for inviting me. I need someone a little bit old who's got magnifiers of about two, plus two. Does anyone get any plus two glasses? No. Everyone. Oh, there's a yeah, very everyone, general. I'm going to get it for you. There's always somebody. I'm going to get it for you. 
One and a half's fine. I can work with one and a half. That's fine. Yes, thank thank you. you. I forgot my glasses. Uh, thank that, you. That was very, very much. much above and beyond. I didn't mean you. somebody old. That's a rude thing. <laughs> <laughs> what the name was? Somebody of my age. Thank you. Oh, they're perfect. <laughs> thank you. Um, do you want me to read anything in particular? Um, I'll tell you what I'll read. Um, my mother is uh, was uh, an Irish Catholic. This is nine. This will be nineteen. Um, I was born in 1960. My mother met my father in 1959, 58 rather. Uh, she's an Irish Catholic, he's from the Caribbean. And this is at the time of um, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. So if you're black and Irish, you will be forced to live in the same house, work the same jobs. And obviously children result when you put the blacks and the Irish together. Don't know what happened to the dogs. <laughs> and um, my parents, so my mother um, had, because she was an Irish Catholic, she had five children in seven years, and then she became a Jehovah's Witness, and our lives changed, not for the better. So um, I was six at the time, so it's 1966 or 1967, and I'll read you the bit where my mother's had the Bible study, the Jehovah's Witnesses have knocked the door. She's fallen in love with the, tempted to say nonsense, she's fallen in love with the doctrine and the idea of living in paradise forever. And then she gets baptised. Mom gets baptised at the big assembly in London and people start to call her sister. She learns all the rules and all the things she has to do to actually get to paradise. All the studying and preaching and not smoking, and not fornicating, nor swearing, nor stealing, or even thinking about stealing, giving a little bit of money if you can afford it, and remembering the widow's might if you can't, and making sure that everyone knows you're a Jehovah's Witness, because otherwise you're like Peter, who denied Jesus, his best friend, and grabbing every single opportunity to witness to people, even in the most unusual circumstances, like on the bus, or at the park, and then answering questions at the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses by putting your hand up and reading out a scripture and attending every single meeting, no matter what the weather, good or bad, and deciding whether you want to be wheat or you want to be chaff, because the chaff gets blown away. And women not wearing trousers and men always wearing a suit and tie and never ever having a beard because that would make them look like a hippie but a moustache is okay and women not teaching men but knowing their place in God's order of things children being respectful to their parents and obedient in everything remaining virgins until marriage and only marrying another Jehovah's Witness and cutting out any bits of yourself that felt like they were turning you into a homosexual which is an abomination unto the Lord and remembering not to talk to anyone who used to be a Jehovah's Witness. And if ever you were in any doubt about anything whatsoever, there is a scripture in Jehovah's Witnesses special edition of the Bible that can tell you how to behave or what to do or what to believe. And from now on, you will never, ever be in any doubt about anything as long as you live. Play your cards right, keep the rules, and you will live forever. Of course, it's important to remember that Jehovah made us with free will. Maybe you don't want to keep the rules, and maybe you know other games which don't involve the Bible. If that's the case, and you don't want to live forever, there is also something waiting for you. For the liars and thieves, and people who watch Top of the Pops instead of going to the meeting, and people who accept birthday cards, and people who want to have sex with their boyfriend or girlfriend, or boyfriend and girlfriend, and people who think him sound nice, and anyone who's Catholic or Muslim or Sikh, Christadelphian, Methodist, Baptist, Mormon, Seventh-day Adventist, Church of England, Hindu, Jew, atheist, Scientologist, Buddhist, or plum not interested, there is a terrible death waiting for them. They will die at Armageddon when God, when God brings his righteous judgment 
on all the evil people in the world with earthquakes and floods and fires and death and destruction. There is not long to wait. No, the end will come in 1975. <laughs> What's so fascinating about, about this memoir is that this is a, the story of a childhood where you and your brothers and sisters are constantly working out how to, to, to dodge, to be cagey, to be yeah. smart around all of that, and also around some of the decisions that your parents make. Yes. Because you're kind of critical compassion, if I could put it that yes. way, is also trained on your parents to whom this book is dedicated. Yes. So we have one of the questions that we had, um, this is from um, Lana the the Theodolou. Is, are you here, Lana? OK, um, Lana Theodolou, how do you approach writing directly about family members? And are there any difficulties that come with this? Which I think is um, like a, quite a big question in the mind of anyone. who. Yeah, and it. I think you can't, for me anyway, don't write to settle scores. If you're writing and you're, I mean, I'm angry about lots of things that happened in my childhood, but if you're angry with your parents or you're angry about someone or you, you want to get it out there and you want people to realise how bad someone was, you are not clear-sighted about what happened. You're going to miss something. Don't write to settle scores. Um, my parents were useless. They weren't cruel. They weren't malicious to us. I mean, it was cruelty. They weren't getting up in the morning and thinking, I know how to make the kids' life hell. They were, for their own reasons, and largely because of their backgrounds and upbringing and racism against Irish and black people in the 70s and 80s, they were not good parents. Um, and we knew they weren't good parents. And, you know, I was hungry. I was cold. I was not looked after properly in many, many different ways. But I learned a long time ago that that's they were human beings before they were my parents they had so many bad things happen to them my mother was unhappy she had mental health problems my father was just a displaced much uh, misunderstood and maligned man and it came out in very odd ways and so I think when you write about uh, those people particularly people I mean my parents are dead I would never have written this while they were alive never they would have hated it even though every word is true, they would have they would have had a different view of what happened. Uh, this is my view of what happened. My mother would have said, I did my best. My father would have said, I did my best, and they did. Um, they would have been horrified to think some of these details are out there. Um, but I definitely wanted to be fair to them. And, I, and I'll, I'll tell you now, when I was asked to write the book, um, I wrote to my brothers and sisters, and I said, I've been asked to write my memoir. What do you think? I won't write it if you don't want me to. And there's four of them. And they all said, no, you've got to write it. So I wrote it. And um, I said to my editor, no one's going to see this before <laughs> my brothers and sisters see it. So sent it to them on Friday uh, with an email that said, um, here's the book. Um, you can veto anything, any chapter, any words, any phrases, any person that I mention, any events that I mention, you have power of veto over it. I will not, if you tell me the, you know, page 67, line seven, I am not going to persuade you into, oh, but it did happen. You don't even have to tell me why you don't like it. Just send me the page number and it comes out. There's no negotiation. <clears throat> So on the Friday, I sent it to them and immediately regretted my generosity yeah. <laughs> uh, because it was 70,000 words and there's four of them. So if they each veto 10,000 words, <laughs> I haven't got a fucking book. So um, I was like, shit. And all weekend, the phone is ringing with me. You know, every time I pick it up, I'm like, oh, what's this going to be? And they would go, oh, but you, you know, you haven't covered that bit where I fell over. I was going, it's not your book, though. It's my <laughs> book. It's about me. And we, we just laughed about it. And they were saying, I don't know if you remembered this. And I thought we'd, we'd forgotten about that. And isn't it great the way? And there's no 
there was nothing. It was one sister, um, one sister objected to two words. One sister, two words, everything else. They were going, yeah, that's what it was like. Apart from the fact that they wanted to feature way more than they should have. <laughs> um, the bits about me and the bits that impacted on them were just absolutely, yeah, that happened. And it was so important to me because, you know, I can't write about my mom and dad. It's their mom and dad. It's their sister, it's their cousin, it's their events, it's their poverty. Some of the stuff I talk about, it's not pleasant. You know, it's it, it, from somebody else's point of view, it's embarrassing. Some of the things that happen to us, it's uncomfortable. It's, you know, you feel vulnerable as some of these facts being out there. And yet they were like, yeah, good, tell it. You know, that is what happened. Um, and sometimes I do events like this, and if I can't be asked to drive, my brother takes me. And uh, when, you know, when at the end with the question and answer, someone will say something, you can ask, start talking, and he's at the back going, actually, and he wants to have his um, 10 penneth, you know, he wants to talk about it. But it's massively important, I think, when you write about other people, as far as possible, and I know this isn't the same for everybody, bring them with you. Find a, find a place of, you know, if you find too much compromise, you're going to have a sheeple. So don't, you know, don't compromise so much that you might as well not write it. But find, for me, it's massively important to find a place of peace and conciliation and agreement with what is out there. So two things strike me. During, so one thing, I've got to be honest, I'm, um, I'm amazed. To, all of our sense of our childhoods and our lives are so subjective. Yes. And we're always our own heroes. Yes. Right, we're, we, we're the only hero in yeah. our story. I think it's astonishing that they you got an answering call from each of them. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. And I wonder whether it's partly because of that thing you just said earlier about if you write to settle scores, you won't pay the attention that you need. Yes. So maybe you allowed yourself to pay actual attention. And also, you you know, if you write to settle scores, you're the hero, as you say. You know, you're you're good or they're bad. They do that to me. You're the victim. Don't be the victim. You know, just tell it as it was. And in my in that book, the only reason they agree with it is because I've told it as it was. I I am so not the hero. You know, I. I'm a bit shit. They're a bit great. <laughs> Maybe that's why they liked it. Um, you know, they, I, I've tried to say this is what it was, this is what happened. And obviously there's uh, nine, seven years between the oldest and the oldest. So, you know, someone's one and someone's seven. Someone's seven and someone's 14. So what you understand about what's going on in our family is very, very different. And yet they all could recognise a core truth about it. And I think it, it's that thing, um, the, the clear sightedness. I think if you try to be clear sighted and just say, this happened and this happened and this happened, don't deal with the why. Because when you're a child, you don't know the why. You just know, my mom cries. So you just say, your mom cries. You don't know why your mom's crying. Maybe I didn't. So I just thought, mom's crying, or this is happening, or we have to go to the Jehovah's Witness meetings and it's cold. Don't say why we haven't got the money for the boss. She's Let the throwing, reader work it out. She's throwing milk bottles. She's in her milk bottle throwing phase. Yes. She's going to throw the milk bottles. Yeah, so my mother definitely had mental health problems. She was probably uh, bipolar, if I think about some of her behaviours. And she, um, days of getting the milk bottles delivered in glass. And we used to have three bottles of milk delivered and two bottles she would wash and put back for the milkman. And one went into a big um, plastic laundry bas uh, basket, the sort of rigid, pale pink one, I think it was. And it would just, you, you as a child, you know, you just watch the milk bottles stack up, stack up, stack up till it's right at the top. And then you knew, because we'd seen it before, what was gonna happen. One day she's had enough, she can't cope. And it was very quiet. She wouldn't have any temper about it. She'd just drag that milk bottle out to a, a concrete yard we had at the back of the kitchen. And she would pick the milk bottles up and one by one, she would just smash them against the wall. And she would just like focus in on the concrete and she'd just smash 30 milk bottles and maybe more. And we used to be in our rooms going, 
you know, it's one of mom's turns. And then she very quietly, you sort of hear this grunting noise of the, the noise she made when she was throwing milk bottles. Then very quietly, she just sweep it all up, put the bits in the basket, and she'd be fine, fine for weeks. And then you'd watch the milk bottles. And that's her way of coping. She didn't slap us. She didn't gamble. Do you know what I mean? She didn't have drugs, as far as I know. She didn't drink. That was her thing. And so as a child, you just go, milk bottles. You know, you could hear her dragging the milk bottles. You'd be sort of chinking. You'd think, okay, it's her day for letting it all out. It was a, you know, even then we knew it was bizarre. We knew that was strange behaviour. We didn't know how strange until we were much older. But you work out right the way through the book what you have to do to get through that yes. moment. Yes. You keep your head down. Don't say anything. You, yeah. And you and there are these. I don't want to. I don't want to kind of do spoilers because um, everyone's going to buy it. But um, I mean, there are moments where you the ghost so so kim your sister kim who you typify in this as being like super smart yes there's yes. a there's a point where you get to do this very very beautiful thing which is that you get to sing handles messiah yes yes but you cannot work out because obviously jehovah's witnesses must not sing handles absolutely messiah, but kim there's Finds a lovely a moment in the book where where kind of little little kip is like oh my god she's gonna she's gonna do it i think she's gonna she, and she does it, she negotiates, yeah. she finds a way, she finds a way of selling it, selling it to your mum. Yes, yeah, she was great. I mean, <clears throat> all of my brothers and sisters, I, I, you know, we had, as anyone that comes from a big family, you know, you've got, there's a hierarchy or there's a skill they've got that they haven't got, or that child's going to needle the parents more than that child. You knew it. And my sister Kim was really clever. And she was also good. So she was a good Jehovah's Witness. I wasn't a good Jehovah's Witness. I had a cigarette when I was 10. Uh, but she was really good and she believed, she believed it. That's the most important thing. She would never lie. I would lie like that. Kim would be like, oh, but that's telling me, you know, oh, I can't do that. I'd be like, whatever. Anyway, shit, whatever didn't exist in those days. Um, what she did was she could find a way of manipulating the truth. So it was just this side of godliness. <laughs> and it was so impressive. I just loved her for him. She, my mother, who was not bright at all, not a clever woman, and Kim was super bright. So she would just use these words that she knew my mother didn't understand. And my mother didn't want to say, oh, what do you mean? She'd just say, that's the Greek, mom. And my <laughs> go, okay, fine. And she bought it. So she'd manipulate. And then there was me. I was a child in my family. I was second. Um, I had super smart, super good older sister. And I was quietly naughty. But I was a watcher. That's a second child thing, quietly naughty, Absolutely. isn't it? And completely watcher. I, I didn't really want to do. I wanted to observe. I loved looking and observing. Then the sister below me, I'd have to say she was just openly naughty. Then there was a much, much desired boy who was funny and clever and a showman. Showman, born showman, still a showman. Uh, and then there was the angel child the last one, who was beautiful and good and kind and sweet. And so there was all these personalities. We lived together and we were a tribe against our parents. I mean, you know, we laughed every day, usually at my parents, not with them. But we did, we supported one another and we helped each other survive. And I strongly suspect that another reason why you brought them on the side with you when you sent them that draft was that that sense of tribe and sense of love. Yes. And actually a real sense of love, even towards your parents, who, as you say, yes. I mean, like it's dad in it. He's this dapper, dapper guy. Like just the descriptions of what he wears. Like I want to see his Chelsea boots. Do you know what yes. I mean? Yes. And he's a great cook. So it's, as you say, it's like your childhood, you describe it as a time of you're so much hunger. Yes. But, but then like if Kit's mum's out, Kit's dad gets to cook. It's amazing. And you're just as a reader, you're just salad. So you give us the, I think, I think, uh, I think another reason why your your brothers and sisters were on board is that even when you're being, even when you're showing something to us that is really unacceptable yes. in terms of 
how young people should be asked to live. Yes. You do it with enormous patient, attentive love. Yes. That's what I yeah. think. I think that's true. I mean, I don't didn't intend to do that. I think in just showing the bald facts and me not talking uh, I, in, in the novel, in the memoir, I never say, oh, I later found out or here's the adult talking about the child. It's just what the child knows at the time. Was, um, it, was it tempting to do that? Was it no, did not, you at all. That, okay. not at all. I didn't want to put the wisdom on it and say, you know, that I did that because of that or he did that because of that work it out you know if you read it you can just work out ooh, you know he's angry or he's upset or he's displaced or whatever is going on and it was really important to me um that they my parents although that they don't obviously it's not from their point of view they do speak in it they do say why they were behaving like that my mother um worked as an auxiliary nurse at dudley road hospital which is very inner city hospital uh very very hard work she worked uh, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night in a maternity ward. And she worked with black nurses. She worked with West Indian and African nurses. And she worked really hard and she had other jobs and she was tired and she had a miserable home life and she had mental health problems. So she would come home on a Saturday morning after working 12 hour mm -hmm. shift, freezing cold. Our house was cold, never anything to eat. It was untidy. And the she'd have three almost adult daughters uh four daughters and a son and we'd be sitting there at the kitchen table Saturday morning and she used to come in and start talking about the black nurses and how horrible black nurses are and we'd be like mum were black mm -hmm. you know she never thought about the effect of her words because we were her children she was speaking to the Irish side of us about <laughs> what black people are <laughs> And we were just like we were nudging each other under the table, like, what is going on? And then my father, who was a bus driver and worked nights again, would come home after being spat at by drunks uh, called all sorts of names I won't say, and and hit sometimes, and you know, terrible racism that he endured uh, from white people. And he would come home and say, you know, the white man, he's like this, and you know, white people, they're like that. And we'd be like half white dad and we never said it because it was just not worth saying it to either of them they didn't understand he's talking to the black side of us he's talking to us about what it is to be a black man uh and a black person in white society in racist white society and then my mother is talking about what it is to be a white person an irish person and to be not understood by black people or not appreciated or whatever and fortunately we never internalized a moment of it we would just, as soon as they went out of the room, we'd go, they're mad. They're both yeah. mad. You yeah. saved each other. You yeah, saved each because other. we, I mean, that's the other thing. There was five of us to say that. I think if you'd been an only child, I think maybe you would have internalised it. But I'm getting the nudge from my sister, like, can you see us? You know, or whatever. Um, so you knew that that was their shit. That's, that's them. That's what they see. That's their experience. And this is us, and we have a different experience, and we have a different understanding of the world. So it was, um, you know, we saved one another mentally and physically, and with much hilarity. And also, the, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't no, there was lots of pain as well. And you had someone that would understand. And of course, I'm talking about the 60s. There were so few mixed race people in the 60s. Uh, I have um, two grandmothers. I have a black grandmother. I have a white grandmother, both dead now. And we, we called them black nana and white nana because that's what they were to us. A white nana actually would never call her white nana. She'd kill you. So she was just <laughs> nana. She was way more scary. And black nana looked after us. She came over from the West Indies and she lived with us. And so you had this collision of uh, the Caribbean and you had very very strong Irish identity nine brothers my mother had nine brothers and sisters so lots of Irish cousins and then we were Brummies you know we were from Birmingham we were English so you had all of this complexity that the only people that would understand the complexity was my sister my sisters and my brother who they they get it they know when you have to do that code switching if I spoke to my Irish grandmother I had a complete vocabulary of Irish words diction, lilt in my voice, subject matter. 
I speak to Black Nana, I've got a whole different voice, lexicon, uh, way of speaking. It's all English, both, both of them are English, but they're completely different and I sound different. And then I've got my own voice, my own Brummy voice. And in fact, my children, when they, if, if, if I'm on the phone and they come home, they could tell you who I'm talking about. I mean, colour wise, because I've got a different voice and I've got a different way of speaking, a different <coughs> music to my voice. Um, because you, you move through in and out of these identities throughout the day. Is that helpful when you're a writer then? If, you're, if you move, if you code switch, code switch, code switch all the time and you're moving through different voices. Yes. Ha tell us a bit about that. Um, whenever I, I mean, every book until the one I've just written, um, I would only ever write in one voice, one point of view anyway. But to, you definitely have an ear for the way people put their phrases together. Like I heard the other day, I was in um, Northumberland, freezing cold. And I said, that I was in a signing queue, I was doing a book signing, and a, a, a citizen's woman, I said, oh, it's really cold in here. And she said, we took our vests in round here. And I just thought, oh my God, that's a phrase. Now, not just a phrase about physically tucking your vest in, but it's like, get ready, gear up, sort yourself out, tuck your vest in. I love that kind You're of You're going to use that. Oh, I'm <laughs> so going to use it. No one else can use it here. Uh, and there was run, another, run to your laptops. There was another one where this woman, and I have such an ear for these phrases, that a woman was speaking to another woman who's giving her a hard time. She'd been really quite arsy. And uh, she walked off. And the first woman said to the person she was talking to, to her, um, goes, oh, she's got a crust on her. I thought, <laughs> she's got a crust on her so that kind of you develop an ear to communicate so I wouldn't have known when I was six or seven that I spoke differently to Black Nana but I know I did and I wouldn't have realized I was doing the code switching when I spoke to my Irish grandfather who he, no one here would understand his accent was so thick and I knew to, to speak to granddad I would have to use slightly softer, featherier. I would, wouldn't have an Irish accent exactly, but nearly. And if I was going to talk about certain things, I'd use a different, like in, in Irish, I don't know if there's any Irish people here. The word for getting above yourself is you've got notions. If you've got notions, you've got notions, you know, like I think she's too good. So there's all these phrases that you would just <laughs> drop into your language. You didn't know you were doing it. It's only when you get to be older now, and I go to Ireland and have all that stuff, or if I go to West Indian Community Centre, or if I speak to a group of West Indians, totally different language and voice. Um, and it's really useful in hearing and absorbing and then taking it out. Yeah, and you can see, again, you can see in the memoir, I think, that that the way that that childhood gives you a training for life. Yes. So there's a bit, there's a bit where you're, I think you're just like sitting on a wall watching people going by in the street and you're like, you are anatomizing everything you yes. see. You're noticing tiny, tiny details, like the way people walk. And yes, that's like, you didn't know you were having, but that was your training. Training was a writer, training, yeah. Right? I had yeah. no idea it was a training. I just could, my, every Saturday morning, I think it was, uh, we had one of, you know, gone of the days when you had a local cinema you know, a, the Gormont, I think as it's called. Anyway, it's an old local cinema. And every Saturday morning, I think it was nine till 12, there were terrible cartoons. Flash Gordon, can't remember the others. Anyway, they were awful. I hated them. My brothers and sisters loved them. So they would go for this all morning two pence, uh, terrible thing. And I used to be like, sit on the garden wall. You don't need to go and look at Flash Gordon. I used to sit on the front garden wall and watch people walk down the road. Oh, it was so interesting to me. The way somebody might hitch their handbag, a handbag on their shoulder or somebody was tired and their head would be to the side and there was two men at the top of the road and I didn't know uh, at the time they were gay men. I didn't know and they were quite camp and they wore tight trousers and a jacket with fringes and I was just stare at them like there's nothing I'd ever seen before and then there was Irish labourers uh, who had a certain walk anyway I'm going to bore you all with the details to me it was the most fascinating thing it was a film 
you just watch these people walk up and then watch this woman walk down there was a tramp that lived on our road and then there was maggie may who had a funny hat and uh, these characters to me way better than flash gordon it was real for a start i don't care about space or whatever flash i've never watched flash gordon i don't know why <laughs> whatever he was doing space, I wasn't space does come into it yeah exactly so for me that woman walking home with a bag of potatoes with a head on the side knocks everything else out into the park just loved it and i used to do that every saturday morning instead of going to the cinema so which brings me to one of the things you know i talked about the the, the kind of compassion in the book i think you're compassionate towards little kids as well and, yeah. and we see i think we kind of leave you when you're early 20s 22 22 um we've had a really really good question um uh, so this is from sarah brewer um sarah brewer says i'd just like to say how much i enjoyed reading the autobiography i'm very familiar with the places she mentions and the areas she grew up in and found it very powerful evoking a lot of memories of my childhood spending time with my nan who lived in Ivor road oh, wow. yeah yeah and my mom went to the same school as kit wow and here's her question which i think is a banger yeah. If you could say anything to your younger self, what would it be? Um, don't worry. Stop worrying so much. I was such a worrier. My God. I had insomnia when I was probably nine. I stopped sleeping. And my dad worked shifts and he would often be up at four o'clock in the morning to go and do the first shift uh, on the buses. And I used to be awake sometimes when he woke up and it was like him waking up uh and i'd hear his footsteps and i'd hear his boots on the pavement as he walked to work and i, I felt i could go to sleep then i've had insomnia all of that time mostly that was worry hunger and cold as well but mostly worry i couldn't even tell you what i was worrying about but probably the fact that i was going to die uh because i was a jehovah's witness and i i was bad because there's a scripture in the bible i think it's ephesians chapter 3 verse 16 you can look it up later um which says that there is a sin of the heart so you can you know you can steal the cock there i can steal the cock that's a sin but if i look at the cock and i want to steal the cock that's also a sin now imagine saying that to a child who doesn't sin every two minutes because you I might do that, I might do that. And you might think about it and discount it, but you've had the thought, so you've sinned. And I used to absorb all this absolute crop and believe that I was sinning every three minutes because I'd think about doing that or I'd, I'd say, shall I steal that food in, in the house? Or shall I, or I've sworn, or I called my sister a pig or whatever it is I was sinning all the time because even if I wasn't doing it I was thinking about it even if I rejected it so I would go asleep thinking I'm gonna die I'm gonna die in 1975 obviously when Armageddon comes but <laughs> even before I die I have the wrath of God I am judged by God I am not meeting his exacting standards I am no good I'm bad. And I think that kept me awake all through my childhood. And I, I still have insomnia now. I still have, I don't have, I don't, you know, can't believe I'm 62 because I was going to die at 15. Every day is a bonus. But um, I still, I think, start that at young enough and it'll stay with you forever. You, it, you're programmed. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. Definitely. Um, thank you for that. Um, so I'm like what I thought we might do is just talk a little bit about um your novels, particularly what I'm really interested in. Um, so um Kit's debut was My Name is Leon, um, her follow-up novel, Trick to Time, which again, Trick to Time. I felt like, like when I read this, it's like, oh, I've been in it, I kind of this yes. is interesting. Um, because some of it is set in 1970s. Yes. Um, um my Name is Leon was um, televised last year by the BBC, um, starring people like um, Lenny Henry and Olivia Williams and Christopher Eccleston. Yeah. And the thing that I'm interested in is what it felt like, what your experience was handing over, because um, your scriptwriter was um, Shola Ami. Yes. 
what what was that process what was it like to kind of re, re, I'm, I'm going to be really assumptive and say kind of relinquish that story yes. but you may not have experienced yes. it yeah. like that what was it like? um <clears throat> so when I wrote the novel we had to work out uh who's going to narrate the audio book and I was adamant it had to be Lenny Henry so adamant we had to fight to get him but got him we did and when he was recording the um audio book I went to listen uh which was Oh, incredibly great. Anyway, when he came out of the uh, recording, he said to me, who's got the rights on that? I didn't even know what he was talking about. First novel. I don't, what do you mean rights? And he explained it to me. So he bought the rights of the novel and then said he wanted to make it into a screenplay. So I had had many conversations. By the time he actually commissioned someone to do the script, I'd had quite a few conversations with Lenny about it and what it was and one of the things for example that he said is he hated Tony you know he hated to Tony um the mother of Jake and I was like he's all right Tony's all right you know <laughs> he was like what well, how can you say that and I was like how can you think he's a bad guy you know he's he's not a bad guy he's he had a anyway I'm not going to defend him I think he was all right so we had lots of conversations Tony very lightly features in the thing so for me handing it over I, I trusted him Right. I knew it wasn't going to be scene by scene of my book because there's an hour, you know, an hour and 20, I think. So I knew that whoever he got was going to have to cut loads and tell a thread of the story. You can't tell it all in an hour and 20. It takes seven hours to read it, or eight hours to read it, I think. Um, so I knew it's going to be an eighth of the book. And so it was quite nice to hand it over in a way. I couldn't have cut out what they cut out. No way. Do you think you were too, do you think it would have felt too hard? Yeah. And Got it. Every, I feel like gutting your story. Every scene that's in there, I think it's got a reason to be there. Yeah. So why would I take it out now? I couldn't have done it. Um, and I got to go on set when they were filming it. Um, oh, it's so great. I mean, just, you know, every writer's dream is to see some word that you wrote spoken by a famous actor. It's like a dream. It's a dream. It's great. I have got a four second cameo in it because they asked me to go, um, asked me to, would I like to be in it? And I said no. Anyway, they persuaded me. You said me. no? Oh no, I was too embarrassed. Also, normally when I haven't got my hair like this, I've got quite a 2023 hairstyle. I said, oh no, because they wouldn't have had hair like that in 1981. And she said, we've got a wardrobe <laughs> department. <Yeah. laughs> so, um, we, we can work with more than that. Yeah. Some yeah. Very bad clothes as well. From night. So they had a whole rack of 19, sort of 78 to 81 clothes. Purple leather jackets. I mean, hideous, hideous clothes that I wore, I had to wear, and a head wrap. And I'm sitting, and it's in the first two minutes of the film. Uh, so you can now you all know you can watch out for me. Obviously, I ruined the whole thing. I'm sitting in a maternity ward with a fake baby. Fake babies are really heavy. They make them really heavy so that you don't just like it's not like a doll. Yeah. Or so so yeah. they put this fake baby in my lap, and I, you, you, you're literally like this. And I think that's what they want. That's why it's about four stone. No, it's not four stone. It's about two stone. It's really heavy. So you hold it, and you put your oomph into it. Because you have to, because it's so heavy. And I think it's the emotional weight that they want you to respond to, but you're responding to the physical weight. So I'm sort of staring at this baby like this, and the camera just goes past. Anyway, that's my moment. That's my uh, Hitchcock moment yes. of being in my own film. It's great. That's really cool. So actually, it sounds like a, it just sounds like a really happy, but be beca because you had had all of those very very useful conversations with yes. Henry and, and also, you trusted him by then and you sounded yeah, like and a good experience. Also if you can't let it go, don't let it go. Don't sell the rights. Because once you sell the rights, you sell the right mm. to the story. He could have put, you know, Leon could have had five brothers and sisters. His mom could have been a wonderful mother. He could have done anything he wanted with that story. I you relinquish the rights to the story. So if you are worried about that, or if you don't think you can bear to watch it, don't sell it. Don't sell the rights. They, you know, you don't get loads and loads of money for selling the rights. So just don't do it. I'd say to anybody. Yeah. It, it just sounds so 
glittery and starry, I think. I'm sure that it's so people... not starry. It sounds glittery and starry. It really isn't. It's um, it's a great privilege completely. But actually, when you're on set, there is so much time, you know, for one scene. It's like we're going to put the cameras here. Now we're going to put the cameras there. It's like, you know, a scene that's a minute long will be 20 minutes in the making. And you're sitting there wearing purple and struggling with the two stones. And it's freezing cold because it's a it was a school hall that they'd made to look like a maternity ward because that's what they would have looked like in the 80s. It's freezing, you know, you've, I've got my fake baby, I'm wearing horrible clothes, I've got 80s makeup on. Oh, it was bad, it was bad. <laughs> But now, but for the for the lovely young people today, that eighties makeup is it's cutting edge oh, now. No, and the Things clothes, have changed. The clothes and the clothes as well, yeah, definitely. That's really groovy. Um, you'll be you'll be. I think the thing that's really nice is that both of the the book. Sorry, I kind of didn't say this in the beginning because I assumed you all knew. But like, my name is Leon was bestseller. It was critically acclaimed. It was shortlisted some, some very very nice prizes. And what's really great is that the television adaptation was equally loved and yeah. equally critically acclaimed. So I feel like there's kind of a nice relationship there. Um, uh, so I wanted to um, pass this. Uh, this is a this is a statement and a question from our colleague um, here at the university, Tony Capstick. Um, he's associate professor of language and migration. Are you in the room, Tony? Hello. Are you happy if I read your words? <laughs> It was, it was good. Um, so, um, Tony, uh, I read My Name is Leon when it came out. I still enjoy reading it now. So rereads. You do reread. You do read. Um, thank you for writing about working class families. Yes. My question is this. It's obviously extremely pertinent to us here in this institution. If boys like Leon were able to make it onto university courses, what do you think universities could be doing to support him in his studies? if they can get into university. I mean, that's the big thing. Um, so we talk, there's two, two types of boy there. There's the black boy from a working class family. Then there's the ch child in care. So he's got, he's a child in care, very, very, very under-resourced. Um, the, the expectations of children in the care system are appalling. Um, so any, just for people who don't know, children that go into the care system, the government or the local council is the parent, supposed to be, in fact, the parent of that child, instead of the natural parents who, for whatever reason, can't look after them. And if that is parenting, supporting, um, you will have children in the care system that have 14, 18 moves, might go into care at seven and move every six months. And so their chances of getting it together enough to do their A-levels and to go to university, they get, they on paper, get lots of support to go to university. Um, but the numbers of children that grow up in the care system and go to university are very, very low. So if that child had the drive and the support um, to go to university, it would be a case of considering what happens to that child in holidays you know sometimes they're where are they going they've got halls of residence where are they going most people go home where's home for a child in the care system that would be major and that would be a could be a shameful thing that they didn't want to say to their friends I have to go into temp temporary foster care and it'll so Christmas holidays will be there summer holidays will be there Easter holidays will be there and that can be embarrassing and uncomfortable and then there's the divulging about this family set up to other people, people, you know, at university or anywhere, you know, will talk, talk to each other. And are they understood? There will always be additional needs in terms of um, support and understanding. My daughter's, I've got two adopted children. And when my daughter, adopted my daughter at two, when she went to school at five, the first week, it was bringing a baby picture. Oh. She hasn't got a baby picture. Um, and I was furious. I was absolutely... Did you have words? Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, I, I sent in a picture of our baby. And I just... Beth didn't know. So Beth didn't know. So she does it. And it's fine. We get through that. And then I went to see the teacher and I said, 
would you for one moment think about the effect that has? And there was another later on, let's do a family tree. Really bad stuff that is for children in care. Don't want to do a family tree. Don't want to think about my family tree. I don't know my family tree. I don't know my cousins and uncles and all the rest of it. And so the school was great, you know, it was just me being over the top. Uh, and then there was, you know, they said, let's do a tree. I think they called it the tree of kindness. Everyone that's ever been kind to them, which is a lovely, lovely way of doing it. And the baby picture changed into ringing a picture of you or a cousin or a friend or a baby that you've seen in the magazine. So there's ways around it. But some of that stuff um, can be very, very difficult. Not that any university course is going to say bring in a baby picture, but there might be stuff in the curriculum or there might be questions said in a lesson that has a disproportionate effect on children in the care system. Um, my name is Leon has just gone onto the GCSE curriculum for English for 16 to 18 year olds. And I've done a video with um, AXA, is it AXA, AQA? AQA. 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 Um, and talking about supporting teachers. And I said, one of the worst things to do is say, oh, Timmy, you can tell us what it's like. Do you know what I mean? No, don't do that. Don't single them out. So, for, you know, my name, I haven't been in the care system. I know a lot about the care system and I have two children who've been adopted. It doesn't make me know what it's like. But for some children, doing My Name is Leon, uh, not as entertainment, but, you know, people reading it, so oh, that was really good. It's not really good for, for children if you've been in the care system. It's painful. It's embarrassing. It's bringing up things I'd rather not talk about. I want to go to school and I don't want to talk about being in care. And everyone knows I've been in care and they're looking at me and going, is that what it was like? Is that what your mum was like? And that's what it's going to be like for some children to study My Name is Leon. It will not be pleasant. And I think for children, lecturers, just to be aware that it's not light entertainment, it's not academic interest, it's not an intellectual study to read about losing a sibling, a mother with mental health problems, a dad in prison, um, loss, grief, identity. That's not entertainment for lots of kids. Um, or just something they can sit back and go, mm, what does the book say about that? It's like churning stuff up. Um, and if there is anything I could say to anyone, it's just be aware of uh, the difference um, and how painful that can be for people that grow up in the care system or in the care system. So it's such a long answer for a simple It was question. a really great answer that, and I, and I think it was a really great question because we, yeah. are, we are thinking about this quite a lot um, here. Yes. We're thinking about widening participation and how yes. can we, what can we do to be inclusive of anybody who might yeah. walk through the door. And it's a, it's a difficult the thing when you've been in the care system. So on the one hand, you do need special treatment, different treatment, extra consideration, sometimes extra time, sometimes an arm around you, sometimes a bit more. You've, you've got that, you know it. The other hand, you wanna be like everyone else. Don't single me out, don't talk to me, don't ask me a question, don't bring it up. It's a really difficult balancing act between being there and offering your love and consideration and your care and shutting up when, don't, you're not singling someone out and making them feel that the only thing you see when you look at that, oh, you're in the care system. Every time I look at you, you're in the care system. Everything, oh, you're in the care system. They want to be like everybody else. They deserve to be like everyone else. They are like everyone else in most material ways. Then they have this extra thing that can burden them. Um, and I should also say, and it would be unfair of me not to, that for some children, Going out of a very difficult family circumstance into care is the best thing that ever happened to them. It's a positive thing. Uh, I speak to children that have been in the care system and adults that have come through the care system and it's saved their life sometimes. So it's not always a negative thing, even if it's a difference. It's not going into care was terrible. Sometimes going into care helped me uh, survive. Thank you for that. And thank you for the question as well. Um, I'm going to suggest if we if we can manage it technologically, I'm going to suggest in a minute we take a quick break.
does that i'm kind of i'm going to suggest that we take a quick break i would very much invite you to visit our bookstore where helen and drew will be thrilled to sell you so you've got without warning and only sometimes you've got my name is leon and you've got the trick to time um and uh they're signed copies and uh, when we come back, we're going to be talking about the iconic collection, Common People. Uh, we're going to be talking about working class writing, and we're going to be talking more widely about the writing life. Yes. Um, and I'm going to suggest maybe, is it about five to seven? I'm going to suggest maybe, what do we think? 10, 15 minutes? General feeling, 10 minutes? 10 minutes. If we very, very deeply, deeply heartening. Um, and I said before the break that we would be turning our attention to common people. Um, I'm gonna do um, stroke, <laughs> stroke, common people. Um, so this, it's fourth anniversary of publication is this week, yes. actually, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, so this is a book which my colleagues at um, the Center for Book Cultures and Publishing will be very, very, very familiar with. Um, it's a book that Kit edited because she wanted to showcase the work of working class writers, both established writers such as Mallory Blackman, for example, or Damien Barr, Jill Dawson, yep. um, and also writers um, who are new to being published, including, so there's a beautiful piece in here called Domus Operandi by a writer called Riley Rockford who had her first publication here. Yes. And um, we invited, she has been to speak to us. Did you oh, know this? No, no. She's been to speak to my um, prose masterclass third year group. Right. Um, because it's a stunning piece of writing. It's a stunning piece of writing I would never have read had Common People not been published. Um, and actually, I want to read you this thing you'll love. Um, okay, so this is from an audience member who I think, who I think might be online. Um, because it's Simon Frost, who's the principal lecturer in English at Bour Bournemouth University. Um, this is what Simon Frost says. For the past two years, Common People has been a regular feature on the MAs in creative writing and publishing and in English and literary media at Bournemouth University. The students are a broad, diverse mix, UK and international, and we do a lot with widening participation. I don't know whether outside the university people know what that means, but it, it means get really broadening the sense of who might come to university, it, it having been quite narrow in the past. Common People provides a reason to talk in class, if, about class and creative writing, both as a creative act, but also very much in the production and mediation and for audience and writer's identity. We invite students to contribute and discuss examples for assessment. I want to thank Kit for her efforts and to pass on the look of recognition on students' faces when we discuss these things. For many, it is the first proper endorsement of their thoughts and feelings from an institution such as a university that they've ever had. For some, it's quite profound, and he wanted to thank you. Oh, that's great, thank you. So while we dry our eyes, um, <laughs> common people in within the publishing industry, there was a lot, it created a lot of buzz and a lot of talk, and there was a real sense that it was, it was changing the discussion about working class particularly working class right because there's also a separate discussion I guess about working class people working in publishing yeah yeah I guess what I wanted to ask you is we're four years on there is no doubt whatsoever that it changed the conversation how do you feel about whether it changed like is publishing changing quickly enough is it how what is it like as a working class writer now to give us a sense of that. What um, that? It's definitely got better. There's no doubt about it. Has it got better? People are talking about it. When I so how this all came about is that when I I got published, I was um, fifty six, and the Guardian sent someone to interview me uh, for the book, and the normal books editor wasn't available, so they sent. I don't know if anyone knows Dawn uh, Foster, mm. who's a housing oh, legend. legend. Legend, legend. Dawn yes. Foster gets the the short straw, and she has to interview me. So in the in the course of our discussion about my name is Leon, I happen to say, and I mean happen to say, and it was a genuine question, where are all the working class writers? And I meant, where are they? I didn't mean why aren't we here? And so me and Dawn end up having this pretty 
political discussion and the, the title of the article was not about my name is Leon, it was about working class writers. She was working class, great, great journalist, uh, much missed. And it sort of galvanized something um, because I then realized working class writers aren't, um, aren't appreciated, aren't acknowledged. And here's the thing if you're a, writing, a working class writer, if you're a writing, working class writer, you better write about a tower block with a syringe in the stairwell or crime or single mothers or whippets and flat caps or minors. That's what you're allowed to write about if you're a working class writer. You've got to, in some way, regurgitate your story, in some way, shine a light. Oh, it's what we're all trying to get away from, that kind of thing. Um, and I'm horrified that that's still the case, I'm afraid. OK, we might have be having more conversations about class, but what is expected from the working class writer's pen or keyboard is the same old thing. Write about that thing that we don't know. A working class writer, could a working class writer write the new Pride and Prejudice and be taken seriously? I don't think so. Could the working class writers decide to write about Gosford Park Lord Fauntleroy rather than the scholarly made? I don't think so, because there's an assumption that that tranche of literature is for somebody else. But a, but a, a middle class writer can go anywhere. A middle class writer can write the yeah, yeah. syringe in the stairwell and they can write, um, you know, the country manners, the country house novel. Um, and I think we we still suffer from that as working class writers, that there is an expectation that you stay in your lane and you write that thing. Not that we shouldn't write that thing. And mostly we do want to write that thing, but we also want the freedoms afforded to middle class writers, which is write anything. Write anything. You don't have to write crime. You don't have to write the gritty urban novel. And the, the misconception as well that they're, that working class people only reside in tower blocks or inner cities. There are working class people, as we know, who live in, you know, tied cottages in rural areas, in small towns and villages. Um, so we need still, things have definitely changed, but we still need to get away from that idea that we have to write, regurgitate our story that can be picked over then. And it's all, oh, isn't it terrible to be working class? Mm -hmm. Well, for most working class people, you know, we don't want to be anything else. We are um, here because of who we are, not in spite of who we are. We're not all, we don't, I don't want to go ski. You know, we don't all want to do that middle class shit thing. Uh, I don't know what it is. I'm just saying, I'm very proud of who I am. Um, Go for it. I'm going to I'm going to repeat your question so that people online can hear it. Okay. Because um, I wondered, I thought if you probably know you, surely we only know you're working class if you give it away. Because if you're a really good writer, yes, you can write about anything. Yes, and you don't very have to reveal your background. You can just be a writer. Okay, so that question yes. is a very, very, very yes. insightful question. Yes. How do they know? Yeah. When you send an agent or an editor, or your agent sends yes. an editor your work, your work. How do the are we going to call them gatekeepers? Are we going to call them tastemakers? Taste we'll call them agents and publishers. Yes. Okay. Yes. How, how do they know unless you yes. advertise it to them? Yes. And very often they won't know. But when they meet you, I mean, no agent is going to take you on without meeting you. No, that would be very, very, well, I don't know of anyone that would take on a, a writer without meeting you. And they will interview you. They will talk to you about how do you know this? What's your experience? Because when an a writer become, gets taken on by an agent and then gets taken on by a publisher. They are investing in a career every time. You'll know that yourself. They're not just saying that writer's got one book in them. Very rare that would be. They want to promote you. They want, and so they love a story. Oh, I was the maid in, my grandmother was the maid in a big house. So I thought I'd write that and I'm writing it from this point of view. And maybe if it's good enough, you'd, you'd get taken on. But mostly the authenticity, because the authenticity of your story normally will match your who you are and the authenticity of your story has to be convincing. So very often, if you were writing a story like a Pride and Prejudice novel and, you know, you talk like me, 
I don't I don't think that would match if you like I don't think that would be taken seriously by the publishing industry I could be wrong but I haven't seen it happen yet so they'd be more likely to probe Probe. Where, where if you, if you if you turned up presenting coding yes. coding as middle class totally yeah they would be less likely to probe because their senses they'll that hear you, your you can voice, kind of write they'll hear everything. your accent um you'd probably be white to write pride and prejudice i mean bridgerton's been an enormous success i loathe it <laughs> i loathe <laughs> it for so many reasons i can't tell you but you know we have improved if you like about who can tell that story and what that story looks like but we have got a long way to go for the working class writer to have the freedom to explore the middle class world with freedom and be taken seriously. Uh, and a working class writer who turns up and says, I've got a great crime novel set in uh, Hackney. They go, yeah, great, great, because I can see you know that world. Now they aren't gonna say I can see you know that world, but that's the vibe that you're gonna get. You match your story. <laughs> you match your story so um that needs to improve what has improved is conversations around class are taken seriously and within the industry they're taken seriously and i know about five authors maybe more than five authors that were first published in common people have gone on to book, to get book deals because sometimes all you need to start you just need a tiny bit of success and you can say oh that person thought I was good. So a lot of it is getting into the industry, then it's being able to stay in the industry, which is very poorly paid for most people. Um, and to have your work and your voice taken seriously, massively important. Interesting. I'm, you put me in mind of, um, so our, um, the MA module that I teach, um, the novelist and, and indeed editor, he works in publishing, uh, publishing um, Kasim Ali. Yeah. Um, came in and was really, really interesting about, so not talking about class, but talking about um, people of colour. He said, everybody, he said, it's great. Everybody wants to sign up a person of, a writer of colour. Yes. And sometimes like he, I mean, he was very upfront about this one. I'm not telling you anything. He honestly wouldn't tell you, but you know, he got a very, very nice advance. But he said, he has watched from inside the industry if white authors falter a little bit with their sales, they're much more likely to be supported than the writers of colour that he sees. Yes. He's, he's like, they really want to sign us up. This is a golden time. Yes. <laughs> you yes. Know? yes. And you'll get money for the first book. Yeah. But, but, but then the career, the career, the longevity. Yes. So I guess the question, so I'm super, super, super aware that in this room we have beginning writers yes and I definitely know that some of these beginning writers are working class beginning writers so what can they what can they do and we're, I'm super aware that I'm I'm talking about their agency and, and really the important thing is what the industry does yes but I guess I'm also thinking for my students like are there things that you can share with them that might um, help in this environment as it is now I think really um, be proud of who you are and value your voice and value your experience. Even if you're writing a science fiction novel or the Gosford Park or whatever you're writing, value the, you know, don't, don't be ashamed of who you are. Don't um, water down who you are. Never try and write like somebody else. It doesn't work. Be who you are, authentically who you are. And whatever your life experience, Whatever it is, it will shine through. And anyone that's done any creative writing will know there's only seven stories in the world anyway. There's seven stories. So everything we write is a version of something else that's gone before. Uh, absolutely no doubt about that. So what, how, can, how could you ever tell a thwarted love story that was different to Romeo and Juliet? The only thing you can bring to it is what you know about life and what you feel about life and how you've seen and how you felt it, how it's happened to you that you fell in love or got your heart broken or wanted that person that you shouldn't want or can't have. All of that stuff, all you can bring to it is who you are. That's the only thing that's gonna differentiate you from Shakespeare or <laughs> Moliere or whoever. So 
for, for me, and I only ever had success writing when I did that thing, and I brought to it the painful stuff, the stuff that actually you think, oh, I can't talk about that. That's the stuff to talk about. The stuff that you think it's painful and it's raw and it's betraying something of me. Write that thing. And I'm not saying you're the only person that's had that thought, but you'll have a spin on it and a thought about it that no one else has had. And I think that's not just about class. That's just about anybody writing. Always write that thing where you just think, can I do it? Yes, you can do it. Yeah. The, the the thing that makes you feel vulnerable and uncomfortable totally yeah and then the weird thing and the kind of brilliant thing is that that very thing that that makes you feel really exposed and, and makes you feel alone yes as soon as you write it down and other people read it you learn that you're not alone yes absolutely you had a question yeah i've heard before um the statement of oh, write what scares you um i've never quite understood it but the way that you put it there i think the more apt statement would be write what you're scared to write yes yeah great i know that when i wrote my name is leon um <coughs> i worked for 14 years in criminal law and i and, and two years for the prosecution and i can say undoubtedly that the men mostly men that i worked with um so many of them had come from the care system um or from from really bad family circumstances and but some of them are bad men that have done good, bad, good things and bad things and vice versa. And when I came to write my, and I've got two children in the care system, I've worked with foster care and I've worked with children in the care system. And when I came to write my name, I was like, the weight, the weight of those stories and the desire I had not to exploit them and not to get it wrong and to do no harm was immense. I felt all of those stories sitting on my lap and just going are you really gonna say that are you really gonna do that as well as to all the mothers with mental health problems mothers that are just not very good at their job um absent fathers all the people that are involved in my name is leon and i just had to take a deep breath and do it it was very it felt like a big deal you know i thought i'm just going to tell this little story about this little boy one summer of his life and just see what i can do um, but there's no doubt that when I go out and I speak uh, and I go to prisons and I speak to, to men in prison, you know, you can feel that this isn't, um, this isn't an easy thing for some people. So for me, when I wrote My Name is Leon, I was like, it, it, was, it was weighty. I wouldn't say it was scary. It was weighty. And I felt the need to be true and authentic and compassionate as well as not too miserable. You know, not everyone wants to read a miserable story, so you have to make it light in places. So, um, yeah, for me, it worked. I wrote two novels before I wrote My Name is Leon. Tell us this story. Hold on to your hats. <laughs> so I wrote, uh, my first book was a crime thriller, and I got a really good agent from a really good agency, interestingly. She sends it out to all the publishers, and she goes, you know, we're going to get, we're going to do it. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is great. Crime thriller. I love crime thrillers and I read a lot of them. So we get the really good rejections, which sounds like an oxymoron, but it isn't. It means that, that it's really good, but no. And this one very good agent uh, publisher said, look, if you can tell me what um, shelf it goes on in Waterstones, I'll put it there. But it's a bit too much of a thriller to be crime. Uh, sorry, a bit too much of a thriller to be literary fiction. And it's a bit too crimey. So it didn't fit anywhere. So my agent said to me, look, write another book and we'll publish that one and then get this one published second. So I'm like, that's good. Two years, I go away. I write another book. It takes me two years. I go send it to her. And she sends me a message and she says, come down to London. We'll talk about it. I'm like, thank God. So uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. And that ticket, I think, was £120 from Birmingham to London because I've peaked peak time got two children two someone's looking after the two children sending them to blah 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 you know every every mother here knows that a 10 o'clock in, in the morning appointment in London means a lot of money and organization so I go down there I'm so happy I cannot tell you and she picks up my manuscript when I walk into her room and she says that isn't it and I was like oh 
right okay she said it's just not very good and I said but I I've made it really I've really made it into a thriller because that guy said it was too literary I've made it into a thriller she went no it's just not it I was like oh okay um thanks I said like an idiot um okay well thanks for reading she said we'll just write another one and I was like oh my <laughs> god you know two years we're talking not it's not a short story it's not a so anyway, I go away, I thank her for her for being maligned and I go away and I write another book. And when I got home from that appointment, uh, after spending all that money and time and hope, I sobbed. I was absolutely distraught. I thought, who did you think you were that you could write a novel? You obviously can't. You're rubbish at it. Um, how embarrassing. I was so ashamed. I was so embarrassed, not one second did I blame her. It was all me, it was all wrong. I'd embarrassed myself, I just can't write. And it took me a long, long time to actually start that third novel, which was My Name is Leon. And I just thought, okay, I had a short story, which was a chapter out of My Name is Leon. And I decided that short story would be a novel. And I had to take a deep breath and actually write the painful thing, not write the crime thriller caper that I love, by the way. And I will not hear a word said about crime thrillers being easy reading or easy writing, actually. Um, and I, I, I wrote that thing that was painful. And I wrote it in about a year and um, three months, sent it to her again in March. And by August, I hadn't heard anything. So in August, I get in touch with her and I say, have you by any chance read it? And she said, um, yeah, actually, I'm really glad you've um, wrong. I'm going on maternity leave. Don't wait for me. So she sacked me. Not many people have been sacked by their agent, let me tell you. I have. So she sacked me and she suggested I go elsewhere. And she gave me a couple of names. And one of the names she gave me is my agent today who sold my name is Leon and the rest is history. But what I would say to anybody who has suffered like that is acknowledge the pain of how hard it is when you get rejected. It's not, you know, oh, pick yourself up. If you really want to do it, you'll do it. Well, I was in a very fortunate position where my then husband worked. I didn't have to work. I could, I could take two years and write a novel. I could get someone to look after my children. I could go on a writer's retreat. For a lot of working class writers, that's out of the question. It's more like six years to write your novel that someone might say, that's not it. So it's a very, very hard thing to keep going sometimes. And that, you know, blase, throwaway comments people write about, if you really want it, you'll do it. It's not quite like that. You can really want it and you can't do it. Things step in the way or people have made you feel utterly ashamed of your ambition or utterly ashamed of your talent and haven't supported you so it's not always a case of I remember when I was doing common people for example um I don't know if I can swear that badly no I won't you can, swear well, you anyway. can swear here this is kind of this okay. is, they're quite sweary a knob a knob contacted me and said <laughs> okay. um if if these working class writers were any good they'd have already been published and nothing could be further from the truth. The cream does not rise to the top. The cream can be suppressed. The cream can be diluted. The cream can go sour for want of attention. There's all sorts of reasons why working class writers don't get published. And my, my story of rejection is one of them. Now, it just so happened I could keep going. I could keep going for another 10 years because I had financial support at home and I had personality of being quite arsy. There's some people who that would have broken them. And that's not because they're weak. It's because they haven't, just haven't got the thing that need that they need or they're sensitive souls, much more sensitive than me. And they'd be crushed by some of that. And I did have my brothers and sisters going, oh, she's not what she's talking about. They don't know what they're talking about either. But they would say, she doesn't know what she's talking about. You're great. You know, you ha I had all that first stroking. Some people haven't got that. And so... It was a joy. I dedicated the book to the knob that said the. Um, <laughs> um, and I, I loved it. I loved it when those, you know, it got published. 
And one of the things about Common People is when it got published, I wanted to anonymize everyone's story so that you couldn't tell who was well known and published already and who was brand new. Um, but actually, it was really important that people had their name on it. And there is no difference in quality at all no. between the well known writers and the first time writer. There's no difference in quality. They're all superb stories. So, um, rejection, very, very difficult. But if you can, keep going after you've acknowledged the pain and ranted and railed against the world. That's an excellent bit of advice. Um, we've had a really, really interesting question from, you told me how to pronounce this surname. Faye. Jamie Faye. Is Jamie Faye in the room? Maybe you're right. Okay. Um, I just think this is such a good question. When did you realise you were working class? Yeah. And had a different yeah. story to tell. And do you feel middle class now? You kind of semi addressed this earlier by going, I don't want to go skiing. I'm quite proud to be working class, yeah. but I'll never be middle class. Never, never, never. I could have all the money in the world. I've got a middle class lifestyle. Absolutely. My children are middle class, definitely. Um, I always use the example of Wayne Rooney, who's a millionaire, or any other footballer for that matter. Does that wealth make the middle class all of a sudden? No, it doesn't. It doesn't make the class is not about wealth at all. You have impoverished gentry without two pennies to rub together, you know, lord and lady so and so, and they live in a crumbling mansion and they've got nothing. That does not make them working class. It's not about money, it's about life chances, it's about education, it's about capital, it's about uh privilege. So after so many things, and it's not about money. Um, so I will never, ever, ever step out of being working class. But I would never have called myself working class when I was growing up. I was sub-working class. There's nothing working class about my family or my life chances. Um, I lived on a, a street of terraced houses, uh, all the same. And my neighbours, I thought they were middle class. I thought they were posh. I had no idea that they were the same class as me because they weren't. They had food, they had holidays, they had a car. The children had new clothes, not clothes from a jumble sale. Um, they had well-tended houses. I thought they were work normal working class people. They were sort of, you know, what people call decent working class. Phrase I hate. Respectable. There's, yeah, there's no such thing as indecent working class no. or dis disrespectable, unrespectable. Um, so we were, immigrant class we were sub working class we definitely didn't reach to be working class and I only started describing myself as working class once I got into publishing I'd never have said I was working class even though working class goes from in in the minds certainly of the Daily Mail um people who've never worked and perhaps whose grandparents never worked right to people who've got two cars and a you know semi-detached house or a detached house you know, there's this big swathe of people that are working class with all of those different life experiences. Um, the, the way that some of the tabloids talk about being working class is appalling, you know, scroungers, scum, all the rest of it. Um, and then there's the sort of decent working class people that work really hard, salt to the earth. David Cameron, the shirkers and the workers. Do you remember that? Totally. Yeah. Absolutely appalling language. Um, and, and for me, working class is, I, I can't imagine ever being anything else than, than this. I'm utterly, utterly proud of it. Um, and don't see, don't understand why some people aspire not to be. It's because of all these, um, oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Let's move to questions. <laughs> Sorry. No, go, go, go. Um, Jenny has asked, if you think that growing up in a working class household makes you more driven to achieve and to make the most of that opportunity even when not good? And the second question we have is from Lawrence, who asks about um, the, about agents and their relation to class theory, which is... Um, most of the agents are in London, which makes it difficult for working class writers and if they're outside the M25 to meet an agent if it's pretty fair, so just means, etc. Is this situation where agents are based in London changing? 
Okay, so I'll answer that one first, then you have to remind me of the second one. But the first one, the second one, which is about agents being in London, yes, it's appalling. And if there is anything good that came out of the pandemic, and very little good that came out of it, it was that things now can happen on Zoom. Um, you know, back in the day, there was Skype. I don't know what Skype did wrong, but they didn't get it. <laughs> uh, all of a sudden, no one wants Skype. Everyone wants Zoom. Poor Skype. I feel sorry for them. Um, so there was always the opportunity for a phone call as well. And if agents thought to myself, actually, do you know what? That girl's in Scunthorpe. That writer's in Middlesbrough. Will I ask them to come to the office or will I try and do it on the phone? You know, it, all it takes is a slight shift of focus to think about people's family circumstances. And um, the agent from the agency, which shall be nameless, um, could have rung me and said, you know what, I don't think this book is it. Don't call me down to London. Um, you know, just be aware that for some people, this is an enormous big deal. If Even if you're in London, it's a big deal to go to some parts of London, let alone if you're outside of London. So all it takes for agents and editors is to make use of technology a bit better. Phone, uh, Zoom, Skype, if you're old school, all of those things um, that means that being in London is not such a detriment. It is still a detriment in that agents live in London and, so, and most of the literary world happens in London. Um, and that's never gonna change. I don't think, even though loads of publishers have opened um, little offices, there's Harper North, isn't there? Harper Collins has got the North, there's Hachette, I think I've got Bristol and somewhere else, but they are satellite offices and they're very much satellite offices. The big decisions, they're made in London. And that's not just publishing, that's acting, that's ballet, that's everything. All the arts happen in London. We're never gonna change that. But I do think the people that work in London are a bit more cognizant now that it is not a joke to get on a, a train early in the morning, go to London to have some bad news or even to have some good news. Give me the good news on the phone. Uh, first question was to make about class. Um, the first question was about uh, whether you think growing up in a working class household makes people uh, want to achieve more than they can. Yeah, no, I don't think that at all. I think, there's, there's something which you hear all the time if you work with children. Children are resilient. I cannot tell you how much I hate that phrase. Mm -hmm. If you're a child and things are happening to you, you have no choice but to be resilient. That's not resilience, that's powerlessness. There's a big difference between being resilient and being powerless. So if, let's take Leon, bad family circumstances, uh, mother goes into care, loses his brother, lonely blah 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 blah. what choice did he have no choice so it looks like resilience because he's not crumbled or falling on the floor or whatever it looks like resilience um and i would say that about working class people you do, you of course you have the drive to succeed but also the how hard it is to, to be in a working class environment sometimes where you have poor housing uh, poor education for your children or poor education for yourself, um, not enough money, poverty. We all know about food banks and the absolute disgrace it is that they are proliferating and needed so much more. So if that's your life, um, of course you want that to change, but that can grind you down so that you can't achieve. Those circumstances for some people, with some personalities, with some support networks, in some communities, that can be a drive to succeed. And for other people in other circumstances with different personalities and family backgrounds, that is a recipe for being broken. So some people will achieve and think, right, I'm gonna do something about it and get out of it. And some people think, I can't do this and I'm gonna have mental health problems and I'm gonna crumble and I'm gonna fall. So I don't believe class is the driver for success at all. I think it, class and being working class can be, can act to people's detriment, definitely. Any questions in the room or indeed any others online? Um, I'm aware it's a shared experience sort of in the creative arts. Um, if someone asks, so what do you do? Or, Someone asks what you do, they're generally asking 
what do you do to earn your money? Yeah. And then you answer, oh, I'm an author or I'm a singer. You could say I, I dance at Royal Albert Hall. Generally, yeah, it's a shared experience. You'll get a response of, okay, yeah, what do you really do? Yeah. Have you ever had that? And what's what's been your response? Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to restate it just in case yeah. people online. So the, the question is that we, sorry about making this with this. Um, the question is that so often the, the form of question is, what do you do? And actually, I've forgotten the second part of your. Oh, what do you really do? Like what do you? Yeah, yeah. A kind of what do you really? In other words, are not taking seriously of writing or the arts. If yeah. you're if you're engaged in the arts, how do you, how do you respond? If how do you respond if your answer isn't taken seriously? Yes. by your question. Um, I think that's more to do. It was a lot to do with literary snobbery. For example, in the in the publishing world, there are gradations of greatness. So you've got literary fiction uh, at the top. Then I'd say you might have commercial fiction. Then you've got crime and romance. And what you, when you get down, down as it's called, to Mills and Boone, people are definitely thinking you're not a real writer. Because and it's read by working class Because women. it's read by working class women. <laughs> or just because it's romance and it's seen as throwaway. Well, if you like reading it, that's fine. Um, so often, um, in, in like, as I say, in the publishing industry, there's a sort of uh, expectation that you, you've got to be in Waterstones, for example. You know, where's you? Can I buy your book? It's no good if it's self published or it's on Amazon or it's, it's just online. You know, there's all those sort of things where there's this, and then it comes down to you not being taken seriously. If, for example, you have self published your novel, even though uh, the books that became the TV series Killing Eve was a self published book on Amazon. Um, and there's lots of good self-published books all over the place. And also, depends on what your measure of success is. If when you start writing, you say, um, I want to win the Booker Prize, that's fine. But if you say, I want to write my grandmother's story and publish 12 copies and give it to every member of my family, that's a successful novel because you set out to do what you wanted to do. So it's very much about your own perception of what success is. Don't let other people define what your success is. If your success is the 12 books for members of your family about your grandmother, that's success. And if you want to win the Booker Prize, just work hard at it. I'm not saying you'll do it, but also own that ambition. Uh, when I did my MA in creative writing at Oxford Books, um, the, the lecturer went round the class and said, you know, what, what do you want to do to everybody? Oh, I just want to write a great book. I want to write like Saul Bellow. I want to write great poetry. And I'm like, I just want to be on the table in Waterstones. Mm -hmm. And I did. I wanted to be on the three for two table in Waterstones. Mm -hmm. That was it. That was it. That's what I wanted. I wanted it and I got it. I got Leon on the three for two table. Actually, you don't want to be on the three for two. You want to win the Booker Prize. But for me, it was going into Waterstones and seeing it with a sticker on three for two. Um, was it a great moment? Like, oh, my it God, it was great. <laughs> I loved it. I was just like, oh, my God, I've got there. Um, and so it's, it's sort of, you know, Americans are really good at this. They'll say, that's what I want. I want to do that thing. I want to be that person. And they're not ashamed of the ambition. I think sometimes in England, we're a little bit like, just want to do beautiful things. Or oh, I'm not sure. Be sure. <laughs> Be sure about what you want and then go for it 100%. And don't let anyone look down the nose at what you want to do, whether it is the 12 books or whether it's the book of prize. Just, you know, I can't swear. But you can, you can. Pay any attention. Fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask a supplementary question because, of course, the economics, I'm sure you all know, the economics of writing, for example, a novel is that unless you're a celebrity who, who we ignore, um, no one's going to pay you anything for the entire time that you write yeah. it. Okay, you work, you work for free, uh, unsure whether you'll ever be paid for two years or three years or four years or five years or however long it takes. Okay, so when you're at that point, yes, when what you to go back to your question, when what you do, I mean, in a very literal sense, what you do is I am writing, yeah, but you don't have any external validation, yeah. How do you, I will say that one of the things I did when I wrote Jubilee was I made a decision to be brave. And when people said, what do you do? I would say, I'm writing a novel, even though I <laughs> pretty much knew it would never be, I knew it would never be published. 
but I wanted to make myself be brave. But you feel so cheeky doing it, it's really hard. So what, so what, like, what would you say? In Discussions are if you're in that process, if it's, your, if it's your first novel and you can't say you've already published anything, you feel- No, that's thing. what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. You're, you're that external, in, in fact, what you are doing is writing. You are writing a novel. Yes. But there isn't that external, people like it when you get paid for stuff, then they take you seriously. Yeah. Right. So when I just to really quick, like when when I said to people what I do is I'm writing, they didn't take me seriously at all. Almost everybody completely dismissed me. But then when exactly that book that I was writing then got got a deal. Then I was interesting. Yes. But I was do I had not changed a single thing that I was doing. I was doing exactly the same. Thing. Yes. So what do you what's what are your thoughts? Um, I think it depends on how much you you want to do it and, and be known as a writer. I was in, I was definitely embarrassed to say it. so I just, I wouldn't say um, I was a writer I said I write short stories and that's like acceptable somehow more acceptable than a novel don't ask me why uh, but I said oh I write you know just just to just write short stories you know before um, and I think it wasn't until I was published that I would ever have called myself a writer I'd say. <laughs> is that kung fu fighting <laughs> uh, i'd say try not to do that and and to own what you what you do and what you love and i'd also say and, and i teach creative writing and i do say this if you don't really love it don't do it you know there's no money in it it's very hard it takes forever go and do something you love you know i, I hear so many people go oh it's really hard oh i have to do it don't do it don't do it why would you do it go and do flower arranging or motor mechanics or cordon bleu cookery or brain surgery do something that you love this is hard enough without doing it and trudging through it I absolutely love it I love writing I think about writing all the time I think about sentences I listen to things I look at the color of that thing and I think how would you describe that color I, I inhabit it. I love it. And if I, the day I stop loving it, I'm going to stop doing it because there's no money in it. You might not win a prize. You're probably not going to win a prize. You're fighting tooth and nail to get into the tiniest publication online. Um, there's a lot of disappointment. It's hard. It's largely thankless. Occasionally you get a little and then it's gone. So don't do it if you don't love it. Love it. Uh, and enjoy it and of course you know everything even things you enjoy can be difficult and have fallow periods and you can have periods of unhappiness but generally speaking if you want to do something else do it or, or write it and just be glad that you have that drive to do it and sometimes writing is the reward writing is its own reward now that's very easy to say if you've got to pay the electric bill it's not its own reward because your words won't pay the electric bill so you have to do something to pay the electric bill which is astronomical these days as we know so of course you've got to do you, you want to make some money out of it and you've got to probably do something else as well as write but i would not do it if i didn't enjoy it and love it i don't understand anyone that does yes yeah i just wanted to ask um, how much does your racial identity um, colour your writing, if at all? Okay, I'm, sorry. I'm, Ooh, I'm so sorry. Question. Okay. I don't know the writing um, course here at the university. It's amazing. <laughs> right. Okay, so in terms of the demographics, what is it in terms of cultural diversity? So that's two questions. Okay, so the two questions are got the first one how how you feel? Feel? that's right how, how much does your racial identity yeah. color your writing if at all yeah so to what to what extent does your yeah, racial yeah. identity color your writing and the second question was about here at the university the, the, the kind of demographic writing, for people on creative yeah, writing because a lot of people from the black minority um population mm -hmm. much more risk averse so the parents will be like you're going to be a doctor a lawyer an engineer you get a sense of your job. You don't yeah. go to write. Yeah. You don't become, you know, uh, you know, a a theatre dialect. So that's what I. That that sense that it's hard. It's hard to take a risk on in such a fragile occupation. So uh, so I 
very briefly after you have answered. I'll very briefly answer your other question because mm -hmm. it's not really fair to ask it <laughs> about the demographics of creative writing here. But how much does your racial identity sort of um, affect what you write and how you write? Entirely, entirely. So um, being born when I did and being a black Irish person in Birmingham, you are automatically an outsider. You know, there is nowhere to fit in. There's no, when I was growing up, there is no mixed race community at all. You're going to be the only black people we were, the only black children at the Irish Centre and at the <coughs> African Caribbean Centre, we're the only people with a white mom. So we didn't fit in anywhere. So you're an outsider completely. Outsiders, being an outsider is absolutely great training to be a writer. It's perfect. My first novel was about a mixed race boy in 1981. That was, you know, a lot to do with my upbringing. I know what it was to have a black parent and have a white parent and have their different views. My second novel was about being Irish in 1974 with the black, the Birmingham pub bombings, where my Irish family um, suffered Irish racism. Uh, my grandmother and, and my uncles and aunts definitely suffered from being Irish. Um, being under working class is a largely to do with the fact that both of my parents were immigrants. So we had a very different working class experience to the working class experience. If you were a white Bromley working class, you were having an experience of the class system or of, of, the, of writing. But if you're outside of that, you've got a different uh, experience completely. So all of my writing is colored by who I am. It's, I, I can't imagine um, writing something. That's probably why I couldn't write anything about space or vampires <laughs> because I don't know how to, to have that kind of imagination. I have to write from, um, on some level, my own experience of the world, which is as a black Irish woman. Uh, and a Bromley and working class and so on. Yeah. Sorry, just, I know you're going to say something, Shelley, but I was going to ask about coming from Birmingham. So, because I was going to be set up, I was going to feel like the minority in her education. Originally. How much did the, does coming from Birmingham reflect your other thinking of them? Oh, yeah, massively. So, in so Bromleys have got a particular sense of humour where. Um, it's very flat, it's it's very, it's not cutting exactly, but my God, if you've got something that you'd rather not people that didn't talk about, that's what they're gonna talk about. Um, it's, um, you, you cannot take yourself too seriously. You cannot get above yourself. You, um, if, if, you know, if you're from a Brummy community and anyone got, so, so in Birmingham, there's a place called Solihull, don't know if anyone's heard of Solihull, think um what's his name someone did a sketch about somebody you know considerably richer than Yao do you know yeah, that sketch yeah, yeah. right that's somebody from Solihull that's mm -hmm. what it's about so in Birmingham in Mosley where I'm from if you thought you were too good and especially when the blacks and Irish started moving in you moved out of Mosley and you went to Solihull and that's just like the, mm -hmm. there's a phrase for it in Birmingham and it's called B92 syndrome and that's the postcode and it's because you've got B92 syndrome, you think you're too good, you think you're better than Birmingham. And it's that kind of thing. And definitely, I write about, I, th I think that's why I write about normal people. I write about people who haven't got B92 syndrome. They know who they are. They stay. They stay and they love it. And I, I, I do really love people who know who they are and have no pretense have no pretensions. Yes, I know you've got an answer a question, but let's just do it. Um, but relevant to the previous section when thinking about writing what represents yourself and giving language that represents your life. Um, I feel like a lot of writing so far, you know, it's changing a little bit, so I'd like to know your thoughts on that. But a lot of writing is sort of marketed in a way that it's meant for a white middle class person to read comfortably. Um, for example, I would never call my grandmother grandmother. She doesn't speak English. I call her something else. So, if I were to be writing a story and wanting to incorporate that, do you feel like it's much less accepted? There's more hesitancy around it. There's more of a need to explain your culture through your writing, but then it's not as authentic in that sense. 
Okay, so it's a great, great question. So this is this is a question really about the implied reader, the way that readers are constructed, and is there an assumption? The question is, is there an assumption that the reader is, for example, a white middle class person? So that if you inhabit those other languages that you've been talking about, that there's more of a hesitancy in publishing to publish that. Have I encapsulated your, yeah, what um, do you think? I'll give you an example. When I write, wrote, uh, my name is Leon, um, so in Birmingham, you would never say mom, M-U-M. It's M-O-M. And it's not anything to do with America or whatever. It's just that's what people say. They say mom, not mom. And um, the editor said, oh, well, you know, that's American. I said, OK, because it's my first novel. When this came along and I'm saying mom throughout and they said, oh, well, you want to change it? I said, I will not be changing it <laughs> because... I've grown up since then. And also it's so important to me that anyone from Birmingham, if, if I published that with MUM, I would never have lived it down. All of Birmingham would have been on my case. B92. B92 syndrome, who do you think you are? So I absolutely stuck to my guns about that. And it's a tiny, tiny thing. It's a tiny thing. Um, but for me, it's, it was very, very important in the authenticity of the piece. If you're a beginning writer, like I was, you will see in my name is Leon, it's M-U-M, because I didn't feel I could advocate for myself. I was so overwhelmed, I was so happy to get published. They could have said, Leon's going to be called Brian, and I would have said yes. <laughs> I would have said yes. Let You're, me so tell you. You're so grateful. I would grateful, have said yes. You? I was grateful. They could have said anything. I would have agreed with it. And if you're a new author and an inexperienced author, you're much more likely to buckle on those things. Um, maybe you should. Sometimes you have to, to, you know, you have to make compromises. But mostly if it's really, really important to you, try and negotiate and explain to your editor why it's so important that actually that word is used in that context and not in italics, which is the other thing they do. Like, this is a foreign word, you know. You want it to just be, no, work it out. Work it out from the context. Let me just write it as I, as I want it. Sorry, Shelley, you've thank got a question to answer. Yeah, so I want to thank you for that question. I mean, I've had time to mull. The answer, I mean, the general answer is that my sense is that we're actually quite an inclusive. So creative writing is within the English literature department. It feels quite inclusive. I, we, I work with students from a lot of different backgrounds, but I'm now, I have never thought to wonder whether for a creative subject which might lead, as you say, to a kind of more <laughs> fragile way of earning a living, whether actually there's less take up. So what I'm gonna do now is go and find out, I'm gonna talk to somebody who knows about stats and can co compare, I don't know, the art, the art department and the creative writing department with kind of the general university. Thank you for the question. Um, I know we're, but we could have said we'd finish at eight, but I kind of feel like the last question shouldn't be for me. So just, has anybody got a really quick question? Yes. I think, excuse me, I'm writing a memoir. Did you, um, did the act of writing it now actually change anything that you thought you already knew about your childhood or upbringing? Or, or was it a case of just it was regurgitating those memories? Because you did say that it was, yes. you know, from the child's point of view in a lot of it. Yes. Whether the family changed the book on that, did it change what you thought of it? So the, the question is, um, was the was the right the act of writing about childhood actually quite transformative in terms of like did it reveal to you Kit stuff you thought you knew but didn't am I yeah, yeah. okay um, <coughs> I can only say it got crazier um, so I knew it was weird I did know it was weird I always knew it was weird but then because all I did was I, I there's no plot you know there's no plot I'm writing a memoir I'm still alive so there's no you know what you do so I just went down I said that I'll write about that and I'll write about that and I'll write about that and I just had like one word that and that and that and then you look at it you think it's mad like there's one incident in the book where like I say my mother was strange and one summer she made my brother who would have been about six or seven at the time wear lederhosen for no reason whatsoever so these green <laughs> leather lederhosen were purchased from I don't know where, we had no money. And my brother, who was like a stick insect, he was so thin. And the lady had sort of stood off him because <laughs> they were just heavy green leather with red piping. 
And we were like, thank God, that's not me. There's only one. Woman. <laughs> and so he had to wear the lady hose. And then the same summer, she bought herself um, a, a furry um, David Crockett hat with the tail and a mouth organ. And she spent the whole of the summer sitting on the back step, learning to play Beautiful Dreamer. And we go to her and go, Mom, we're hungry. And she was just, <laughs> <laughs> that was a summer. That's it. That's the whole story. And my childhood had like that. Then it had the milk bottles. Then it had Black Nana. And it just had all these things. And when I wrote it out, I thought, it sounds mad. And it was mad. But it was also, it was my childhood. I didn't know. It's only now I'm older and I know what it is to have an ordered house and to feed your children and never buy laid a hose under any circumstances. <laughs> only now do I realise that was weird. That was bizarre. As, as bizarre as it really, really was. At the time, we, we laugh about it. You know, we still have, you know, family do's and we'll laugh about it. But mostly now I do realise it was extraordinarily weird. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'm I'm so sad to be finishing because I just want to kind of keep you here in a very <laughs> strange, <laughs> creepy way. Pitch, frankly, um, I want to thank you so 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 much thank you. for um, your generosity actually in sharing with us what you have. A generosity not a huge surprise to anyone who's read your work. Thank, thank you. you. Um, it's been a real joy. A real thank joy. you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.